sometime later, sometime later, that's the way the Living Bible starts it off. After his good work, King Hezekiah, after some, I'm sorry, sometime later, after this good work of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib of Assyria invaded Judah and laid siege of the fortified cities, meaning the city, cities around, planning to place them under tribute. When it was clear that Sennacherib was intending to attack Jerusalem, in other words, he's, he's conquering the cities around. Now, when it was clear that he was intending to attack Jerusalem, Hezekiah summoned his princes and officers for a council of war. And it was decided to plug the springs outside the city. So they organized a huge work crew to block them, cut off the, brooks, the brook running through the fields. Why should the king of Assyria come and find water, they asked. Then Hezekiah further strengthened his defenses by repairing the walls wherever it was broken down and by adding fortifications and constructing a second wall outside of it. He also reinforced Fort Media and the city of David and manufactured large numbers of weapons and shields and he recruited an army and appointed officers and summoned them to the plains before the city and encouraged them with this address. And this address is the key to my conversation with you. Be strong, be brave, and do not be afraid. There's, there, there's the message. Be strong, be brave, and do not be afraid of the king of Assyria or his mighty army. For there is someone with us who is far greater than he is. He has a great army. We're talking about the, but they are all mere men, the king of Assyria. While we have the Lord our God to fight our battles, this greatly encouraged them. And then it goes on to tell what the king, King Sennacherib of Assyria, while still besieging the cities, he goes on. And once again, the message, do you think you can survive my siege of Jerusalem? What are you trying to do? In other words, commit suicide by staying there and, and die by, by famine and thirst? I won't continue to read it because I can share it with you. I've already read it and studied it. And finally, said the, the, finally the king, uh, after sending letters or receiving letters, letters from Sennacherib telling him about the invasion. One of the letters that was sent to the king, the gods of all the nations have failed to save their people from my hand, and the god of Hezekiah will fail too. Now you got to read this. The messengers brought the letters, shouted threats in the Jewish language to the people gathered by the wall. And then comes that glorious moment. These messages talked about God of Jerusalem as though he were one of the heathen gods, a handmade idol. Then King, Seneca, then King Hezekiah and Isaiah the prophet cried out in prayer to the God of heavens. And the Lord sent an angel. Oh, this, is, this is unreal. <laughs> this is unreal. And the Lord sent an angel who destroyed the Assyrian army with all its officers and generals. So Sennacherib returned home in deep shame to his own land. And when he arrived at the temple of his God, some of his own sons killed him there. That is how the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem. And now there was peace throughout his realm. And from then on, King Hezekiah became immensely respected among the surrounding nations and many gifts for the Lord arrived at Jerusalem with valuable presents for King Hezekiah too. Hallelujah. 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 This is a little story. And the more you read these stories in the Old Testament, always remember what, the, what, what Paul says about the stories of the Old Testament. Not only were they real, but they were our schoolmasters. In other words, the Old Testament is the, 
is the ground where it's a place where God laid his groundwork to let us know of what was coming in the future. In other words, he is God and he is able and he can do all things. Now I want you to I want you to hear this carefully. The word that was given, he that is in you, I mean, better said, Second Chronicles, be not afraid. There is someone with us who is far greater than he is, all right? Now, with us, I will give you the scripture of John, 1 John 4.4. 4. And what does that say? He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. I want you to notice the difference. With you and in you. With you and in you. And there is a great difference. God came down, sent his angels. God sent his chariots. Uh, uh, it was uh, Elisha's uh, hand, hand, handyman that was able to see the chariots in the hills because he thought that the, uh, the army would come and swallow up his master and him. And then Elisha prayed and says, Oh God, let that servant of mine see what you're doing for me. He knew it. You say, well, how do you know? How? Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. No, 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 no. It always works. It always works. It doesn't always work in freedom. It doesn't always work in redemption. It doesn't always work that you win. But it always works that God will speak to you and God will let you know. And that's the most important thing in the world. You understand what I'm saying? You, 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 you're looking at me a little... Yeah, because that's, that's where we get caught up in our Christianity. We think the victory of our life is that God give us what we prayed for. But sometimes, not sometimes, most of the time, God does not give us what we prayed for. Now, if you insist on what you want, well, then you're the one in trouble. We, we can't even deal with that. Because sometimes we think, no, this, this is it. This is what God wants. No, God knows what he wants. And we ought to just wait on him. And it's beautiful to know that because no one can save us but God. There isn't anybody out there that can save us. It's important that we understand. But I want to get, give you the difference of the Old Testament with us and the New Testament in us. That's the great difference in Christianity. That's the great difference in New Testament. That's the great difference that comes after the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. That is what he said. It's what John said, I baptize you in water, but the one coming after me will baptize you in fire, in Holy Ghost and fire. And what is he saying? Jesus said it. Jesus said it, that the, the comforter will come. And what, is it, what does he tell us? He'll be with you, not only in you, but he'll be, with, he'll be with you, but he'll be in you. Okay? Now that is a great secret. And we've got to, we've got to watch out. Because God has not left a Christian to battle alone. God has not left a redeemed person to walk out there alone. He has not. He has given us his Holy Spirit. And if we don't acknowledge the power of the Holy Spirit, first in the sealing of our salvation, and second in the glorious infilling, which means he's within you. The Spirit of God is within you. And you say, well, the Spirit of God doesn't fit within you. No, it doesn't fit within me either. But the portion that we need of the Holy Ghost is ours just for the asking. And it's important that we know that. This is, the, this is the most fearful time in the world to be alive. If you don't know it, I'm telling you. The most fearful time. And I'll tell you why. Because the time of the devil is over. It's over. His time is running short. God has set a clock. The hour clock was turned. And we're living in the last dribbles of the sands that go through the hour clock. I'm not scaring you. I'm just telling you the truth. You know how I feel about the coming of the Lord? As we leave this door, the trumpet will sound. That's how I feel. You say, well, why? You know, and when you feel that way, nothing else is important. Tomorrow doesn't even care. Oh, yes, you live right. You prepare right. You do the things you're supposed to do. But as far as, uh, as, far as taking charge uh, and you are going to bring forth the product of your life, hey, lay down and die. 
because we don't know how. We are so moody, we are so emotional, we are so up today and down tomorrow. We are so wishy-washy. God is something, hey, okay. what can I tell you? God is something for funerals. God is something for weddings. Uh, God is something for what else? Uh, I don't know, for trouble. But he's not an inner living force in our lives. Uh, and that's what makes Christianity different. Why do the churches all revert uh, uh, to tradition, why do they revert uh, to the stagnancy of ritual? Why do they revert and conform to whatever has been laid down, uh, uh, let's put thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago? Why? Because they have no place to go. The living fire, the living power, the living connection to God is the power of the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit, which is not only with us, but in us is guaranteed in the Bible, in the, in the New Testament. This is what God would do. And you say, Does, is that included? Is that included in the Old Testament? Yes. What did, what did God say to Jeremiah? I will take the heart of flesh, which basically is a heart of stone. Or better said, I will take the heart of stone, which is basically the sinful heart, and I will turn it into a heart of flesh that feels, that has a pulse beat for me. Hallelujah. So Jeremiah knew that. And it was Jeremiah that got the vision of the potter and the clay. The, the vessel that was broken, the, the, the pottery that wasn't any good. But that God took it and turned it on his wheel. You see, a, a potter can't do that. Once it breaks on his wheel, once it's over, well, he's got to start again. But thank God that our God can pick up the pieces and he can make it work. Oh, I love him for that. I love him for that. You know, there's a world out there. You say, but, but they're making it. Yeah, they're making it. But have you ever noticed that sometimes it doesn't even take a century to be totally dissolved? You're talking about a revolution little after the turn of the century and a Lenin that stands up tall and says, uh, the opium of the people is religion. The opium of the people is religion. So no God, for we are God. Oh, and you know, when you tell somebody they're God, shoo, oh God, whoa, whoa. They're trying to fit into the suit. And isn't it interesting, we've lived 1992 and 1993 to see the greatest empire in the world, the greatest empire for negativism, the greatest ent uh, empire for atheism, the greatest empire for everything that has to do with earth and the powers of earth disintegrate, totally disintegrate. Now just a fumbling mass of people trying to put it together, some wanting to go back, because there's always somebody wanting to go back. Remember Israel? We want the garlic. We want the good stuff that we left behind. That's what we want. Let us go back. And God was ready to give them up. And Moses says, please, you took us this far. What a shame it'll be in what they'll say about our God. And isn't it interesting? He, he, he challenged God. And his love was so great for Israel that it was really God's love because God gave him that love. It's just that every now and then God does get fed up. And yet he listened to his servant and brought them through. And I say to you this day, that God's going to bring us through, miraculously and wonderfully. Now, there are lessons to be learned. Uh, the king of Assyria planned an invasion of Jerusalem, and he did it very smartly. He did it very, very precisely. <clears throat> Let's get all the cities around. Once we have all the cities around, well, then everything is broken down. And we can go in. And you would say, well, the king did what he did too. He, uh, he emptied out the wells so that they would have no water. He did this. He did. Look back. He didn't have to do a thing. We do it because we're hyper. We do it because we want to save ourselves. We do it because uh, we feel that we can. We can't save ourselves. Only God can save us. But it's interesting that he doesn't save until you give up. You got to give up. You got to give up being your savior. You know, we talk about so many things in our, in our, 
in our group, but one of the main things in, in life is denial. And that situation becomes so, you know, when, when, when somebody says, hey, you're not, you're not living the way you should, and then you, you can line up all the things that you do right to prove that you are. Yeah, I go to church, I pay my tithes, I'm involved in activities. I, I don't harm anybody. I'm doing exactly what I'm right. Oh, we have a way of giving ourselves a report card that shines. That's what denial is all about. I'm not responsible. He's responsible. She's responsible. That's responsible. That's responsible. I'm not responsible. And it's until we say, God, I am responsible. No one caused me to be where I am. No one. No one, my precious people, listen to me. No one. We get there because we get there. I was a little heavy this week. My son looks at me, he says, Mom, you look terrible. I love that, it's very consoling. <laughs> it's very consoling. And then I realize, hey, we can wear our heaviness. And guess what? Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. There's nobody looking for my heaviness. There's nobody saying, oh, look, I'll carry your burden. I'll do No, no, no. I'll just get that face away. Mama, wake up. What's the matter with you? Okay. Okay, that's all right. That's okay. I, I love humanity. I love humanity because that's what we are. Oh, we love to put ourselves on the top of the ladder and say it's okay, when it's not okay. But if you've read it, I'm okay and you're okay and the next door neighbor's okay and the man in the moon is okay. I mean, it comes a moment where you're, you're, you're the okay kid. You know, you're walking around, everything's all right. If you haven't settled your account with God, nothing's all right. Nothing is all right. And it never will be. Oh my God, don't run out of my church, just hold steady. I'll be through in a minute. But it's not so. He that was with Israel precisely was with them. But the one we have is in us. Do you realize that every believer, every believer that accepts Christ as their savior. I'm not talking about accepting the church. I'm not talking about uh, being a deacon or an elder or an usher. Or, I'm not talking about any of that. You just accept Christ as your Savior and you're sitting here, you'll say, well, Pastor Amy, I did that. That's the beginning. That's where it starts. That's the most important step in your life. That's it. That's it. Everything else we do, and, we, uh, and I hate to say this, we're looking for brownie points. You know, maybe, maybe I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to... Uh, there are other times that sincerely we will do whatever we're told to do and we will bless you in any way that we can. Do you understand what I'm saying? But basically and honestly, it's got to be a look to heaven to know that the day you received him, he came into your heart. And you know how he came in? You know how he came in? In the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that reveals Jesus. He's the one. That's why Jesus says, if you talk bad about me, no problems, but watch out. Because if you cancel the Holy Spirit out, if you talk and deny the power of the Holy Spirit, if you totally reject the Holy Spirit, you've committed an unpardonable sin against yourself because there's no one else that brings the entrance of light. You say, Sister Amy, do you think I've committed that sin? If you still want to repent, you haven't. You haven't. You haven't. The ones that commit those sins, the unpardonable sin, never turn around to look for forgiveness. Never turn around. Never turn around. Never turn around. God is a great God. Now you say, Pastor, well then, he is in me. Now what? Okay. Now this is going to be very hard, and we can have a few arguments on this. And I'm willing, to, I'm willing to break up the uh, fallow ground and, and talk with you. I'm going to tell you everything that's opposite of everything in the world. Okay? But that's okay. You will understand me when I'm through. Don't plan. Don't plan. 
Because when you plan, whether it's a mental plan, don't plan. And I'll tell you why you don't plan. Because when your plans don't work out, you're in the doghouse. And you put yourself there. No one put you there. You put yourself there. You say, but, but the book of Proverbs tells us that we have to be like the ants and we got to plan ahead and we got to be like this and we got to do that and we got to do this and we got to do that. So, Sister Amy, isn't this, uh, isn't this counterproductive? Well, what is it you're saying? <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm saying. Don't plan. Don't plan. Those mental plans, plans, excuse me for using such a word, those carnal plans, don't plan. You say, but, 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 what do I do? Just hang back here like, what, 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 no, don't I, isn't there something I'm supposed to do? Yes. Yes. I'll tell you when. First, don't plan. And second, now I'll kill you. Don't worry. Don't plan, but don't worry either. Because if you don't plan and you start worrying, <laughs> the casino, no good. Don't plan and don't worry. Don't plan and don't worry. Now here comes the, ooh, you know, the combination that opens the safe. And what is it? Be still. Be still. Worry doesn't help in growth, you know that. The only thing we have to do, basically, is right our wrongs. That's the only thing we have to do. The only time that Jesus tells you to do something in very particular form, if you have something against someone, go to them and ask for forgiveness. And don't, don't, don't give your gifts until you've settled that score, because to Jesus it's very important very important that before you give him a present, even a present of your life, that you go settle your score with humanity. And you say, Pastor Amy, it, it, it's a little hard. I've done so many wrongs. I mean, where, where, where do I find the people I've cut short? Where do I find the people I've... Mm. Well, he doesn't tell you to go seek them. In this case, in the case of the, of the, of the gift at the altar, yes. Because it's alive, it's brewing, and it's exactly that. What can we do with our past? We can only turn it over to the Lord. Know that we're washed in the blood. Know that he's taking care of our past. And if somewhere along the line, uh, that past rises up, that we can face it and say, hey, I didn't do too well. I am very sorry. But you see, even there, God's in charge of the timing. Oh, I love him. I love him. Don't plan don't worry don't worry but be still why because it's when you're still you will know that he is god anybody whose brain is going on their next job on their next place on their oh have you ever seen a super hyper co-worker have you ever had one i've had a couple I, um, Brother Rivers, I imagine yours must be very dangerous. I mean, this is when you say, hey, hey, put him somewhere else, you know. Yeah, really. We have got to know. We have got to know. Be still. So much we receive when we're still. How many have problems being still? Come on, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Oh, I love you. This is the most truthful church in the world. I really mean that. I, I, I travel around the country and I ask a question like that and nobody, nobody puts up their hand. And I just look at them and say, you're all liars. And then they laugh because there's nothing else to do but laugh. You understand what I mean. But basically, I've thrown out a, you know, a 97 ball. And uh, uh, I, I, know what I, I know what I'm saying. Because we're so inhibited and we're so afraid that somebody said, no, no, we don't know. Do you think when I wake up in the morning, I know what that day will enhance? No, I don't know. I know the programs. I know the schedule of the church doings. But as far as the day is concerned, no. You say, you know, Sister Amy, you're giving lessons for Christians that are as old as Brother Burgess. No. No. 
if we're going to get to be as old as Brother Burgess, we better get these lessons down pat. Do you understand? Are you hearing me? It's most important. Don't plan. And you say, what, 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 I'm going to tell you what you do in place of planning, okay? Be still. And why are we still just to know him? I would like to put a chart up here, but if people come in, they won't understand the chart. You'll be the only people who will understand the chart. They say, this is a nutty church because I'd put it up like a recipe for baking apple pie. And I would have to say from the bottom of my heart, and I share it with you, that if we want to know God, we want to know who he is. We want to know him. Now, how do we do that? I've said this a million times, and I'm going to say it again. We are failing because we refuse to give God time. Have you thought of it, folks? Eight hours to work, and some of you work 16. You're supposed to have eight hours sleep. Some of you have four, three, two, and some don't. There is not much left to a day. And if anybody here would stand and say, I need a 27-hour day if I'm to follow the Lord. Well, you're not going to get it because it doesn't exist. So you've got to push and you've got to shove so that your day fits the Lord in. And if it means taking a little bit away from your nighttime or from your daytime, you've got to find time. We must get to know him. And we get to know him through the word, through prayer. And here's what I want to leave with you. I, I, I can't help it. I want to know him not because I want to be a better preacher. I want to know him not because I want to do a better job. I want to know him not because I'm a pastor. I want to know him not because I have a lot of responsibilities. I want to know him because this is an important job and I've got to do it right. No, no, no. Those are the clouds that come before us. We must know him and want to know him. In something we're not used to. In his sweetness. In his sweetness. Isn't it amazing when you're not ready for a kiss how they bother you? Have you ever had somebody kiss you at the wrong time? Have you ever had that? Yeah. You don't want no kiss. God. You're tired. They come kissing you. You don't want a kiss. Okay. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That's our, our moodiness. That is our humanity. Yet would you believe it? He wants us to know him in his sweetness. He wants to kiss you. Won't you let him kiss you? Won't you be still enough to get a kiss from God? No, Lord, I'm too busy. I got to go. Sorry. See you later. He wants you to know him in his sweetness. We always come in crises. We're always asking the warrior to come forth. We're always asking the miracle maker to come forth. We're always asking the healer to come forth. We're always asking the one that can do what no one else can do. We never ask for the lover to come forth. The lover of your soul. The one that just wants to sit close to you. The one that wants to embrace you. And that you might feel his breath and the power of the Holy Spirit over you. And your stillness becomes gloriously beautiful. It's then that you don't want to do anything. But be still. But you see, we never come in that spirit. We always come in the gimme spirit. I gotta get spirit. He says, no. Sit down and tell me you love me. And I will love you with an undying love. In that love you will then know how much he cares. Yes, we're emotional people, but I have no problems with this emotion because it's the emotion that flows from Calvary. 
It was a horrible death. Yet the only thing that flowed from it was love and love and love and love and love. And now he sits next to his father. Excuse me for being a little naive. I can hear the father saying to him, they hardly ever tell you they love you. They hardly ever wait for your embrace. Son, what's happened? And he keeps loving us. You see, it's a whole different ball game. We've become militant Christians. We've become doing Christians. We've become on God Christians. We've become double barrel gun Christians. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. This is me in action. And all he wants to do is for you to sit down and be loved by him. At this stage of the game in my life, I don't want to do anything. Yet he's trusted me with the hardest job on the face of the earth. Pastoring. There's nothing hard. I've been an evangelist. I've been a missionary. I've been a chaplain. I've been a street preacher. I've been a track giver. I've been everything you could ever imagine. This job took 50 years to just get me ready for it. And right now, I stand here because God wants me here. Because I'm ready to throw in the towel. It's too hard. Too many pains. Too many sorrows. Too many anguishes. Too many. Too many. But you know why I'm here? Because he loves me. And because I know that through his love and his sweetness, he shares with me that he cares for me. Don't care for yourself. Let him care for you. Em embrace him, love him, because he will do that. And then I give you this. So now you'll understand why I said don't plan, why I said don't worry. This is what he'll do. When you've let him caress you, when you've let him love you, when he becomes the most important thing in your life, not what you're doing, but what he's making you to be, then... And it's the last line of my notes. Got nothing else after that. Then, then, he'll open the doors. He'll open the doors. He'll tell you where to go, with whom to go, how to go. But that's the only way it happens. The only way it happens. We want the door open now. We want the seal now. We want to be exactly precisely no it doesn't happen now it's after he's loved you and you've gotten to know his love and you've let him love you it's after you found out how much he cares for you we're talking particular we're talking personal it's after that it's after you get lost in his words you say pastor amy but i don't i don't understand that you don't have to understand it just read it just read it. You know what the word is like? It's like an artichoke. I used to hate artichokes. I still think they're a lot of too much trouble for nothing. But isn't it interesting? It's not until they're perfectly boiled, perfectly, you know, just enough, not too much. And then there's that little plate of butter or vinegar and oil or whatever mixture is. And you pluck that leaf out and you put it in there. And you take with the, It's just a petal of good it's not a lot just a little bit and you got to be careful you can't take five leaves at a time got to take one one I've learned a lot of lessons from the artichoke first of all it looks ugly yeah it looks like it'll strangle you if you sat in it <laughs> okay but there it is. You see the pace? And some people don't like them because of that. Oh, I have no, I have no time for this. One at a time. Ugh. Throw it away. Well, 
We have to have an artichoke relationship with God. One day at a time. One moment at a time. And he'll open the doors. So stop running. Stop being busy. Stop planning your life 20 years from now. Stop it. Stop it. I always thought that being in ministry at 65, there had to be something wrong with me. I'll admit I've been retarded. I admit I've been slow. But now I've come to the conclusion that I'm a very special creature. And it took God a long time to make me who I am. And the thing is, he ain't finished with me yet. I look in the mirror and guess what I see? Crudita. You know Spanish? Raw. Raw. Yeah. Like God said about Ephraim. Torta no vuelta. And what is it? What did he say about Ephraim? Half baked. One side done, the other side not done. But that's okay. We're going on. We're ready to take communion because I want you to think through this whole communion service at this time how much he loves you. You say, Pastor Amy, can I take communion? If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, if you've received him as your Lord and Master, no, you don't have to be perfect, but you do have to have accepted him because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. It'll be for you a ritual. It'll be for you just something everybody else is doing. So don't do it. I would say to you right now, remember that through this bread that you will be receiving, you have a body that was crushed. I have to say something to you, because there may be some doubts in people's hearts, as far as not planning, not doing, not this, not that.